And today's sermon is baptize and give from the inside out. Baptize and give from the inside out. Now, I have a test for you today as we begin, and hopefully everybody can participate in this test. Whatever your age is, I'm trusting you'll be able to follow and answer. Okay, so let me ask you this. Which cup is actually clean? I've got three options for you. If you're gonna be taking the ACT, you may need to go ahead and study on this. And if you're in college and you already took the ACT, this will be a nice review for you. So here, here you go. Clean on the outside, but dirty inside. Is that cup clean? That could be your vote. That's, that's one option. Uh, another, so what do you think? Would you want that cup? Would you like me to give you some water in that cup? It's, look, it's clean on the outside. It looks good on the outside, very presentable on the outside, just kind of filthy on the inside. Okay, let's go to another option. Uh, another option would be clean inside. Okay, so now we get the water's clean on the inside, but you know what? Your lips are gonna have to touch that outside. You see how it's dirty on the outside? Your hand, your lips is gonna be touching that outside. But look, I've given you now a clean inside of a cup. So it, it's all about your inside. It's all about what's going on internally. As long as you're good inside, everything's fine, right? Maybe not, right? So I'm gonna give you a third option. Let's see, you may have already chosen one of these other two. If you have not already cast your vote in that way, how about clean from the inside out? Would anyone vote with clean from the inside out as being actually clean? So here's the question today. Which one am I gonna to offer to God? Which option of the three that I've given you do you think God wants? What is appropriate to offer to God? If you were gonna offer yourself to God, would it be A, B, or clean from the inside out? What today we wanna to go back to the basics and understand is this runs all through the Bible God is holy. God is holy. God cannot associate, will not associate with what is unholy. Okay? God is reflective of that, clean. Okay? God commands and requires and can only commune with those who are clean. To approach God to commune with God. And by the way, I think you all know this, we're all going to die. When we die for us to be with God in communion forever, we must be clean because God and communion with God, what's sometimes called as heaven, is clean and sanctified. So this is Bible terminology. I know this sounds complicated, but I'm gonna, we, I'm gonna go ahead and share it with you. We need to be what's called sanctified. That was included in our affirmation of faith. We need to be sanctified. Now, today we're gonna to be talking about a Pharisee and Pharisees in general. And let me go ahead at the beginning because when we get into this scripture, it's gonna be easy to say, to kind of throw the Pharisees under the bus. It's gonna be easy to say, oh, they're a bad legalist and they're really, they're mean and I'm, I'd never be like that. And, you know, um, and it's obvious that they should be, you know, rejected by Jesus. But let me go ahead and give some props to the Pharisees. The Pharisees took what we just talked about very seriously as far as the holiness of God. Okay. And in fact, they were very devoted seven days a week, including in how they observed the Sabbath day, in seeking to do everything possible to be holy and to be sanctified so that they could have communion with God. At least that was the basis of their thought pattern flowing initially from key scriptures in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. And again, even as we turn to Jesus, let me remind you this, Christians. Here's what Jesus says. He says this in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, unless your righteousness, now righteousness means being right with God and with other people, okay? Unless your righteousness surpasses 
that, in other words, the righteousness, of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and they set a pretty high bar. So this is almost shocking when Jesus says this. He says, you're gonna have to have a higher righteousness, a higher way of being sanctified and right with God and other people than the Pharisees and the scribes. So Jesus isn't throwing them under the bus at that point. He's saying, hey, they're kind of at a certain level, but you're gonna to need to actually be higher than this. So that should have us thinking as Christians and about how we relate to God and how we live our lives. With that in mind, we're gonna to turn to our scripture passage, and let me tell you, a focus point of reference for us, for me, and for you today will be on the priority, the purpose, and ultimately the power of how we are sanctified and related to God, how we are made holy. So just remember that as we now open God's word. We're going to go back a few verses in a few minutes, but right now I'm going to begin kind of where we left off last Sunday at chapter 11, now verse 37. I'll go back to earlier uh, verses in a few minutes, but we're going to begin at Luke chapter 11, verse 37, and read through verse 44. And I invite you to hear now God's word. Now, while he was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him. This means Jesus. Jesus is speaking, and a Pharisee um, may have interrupted him before he finished speaking. Uh, there's a, one way you can read this is it's right after he finishes speaking. A Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him, and he, Jesus, went in and reclined at table. But the Pharisee was surprised to see that he was not first ceremonially washed before the meal. But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but your inside is full of greed and wickedness. You foolish ones, did he who made the outside not make the inside also? In other words, he's talking about God here. Did God who made the outside not make the inside also? And then verse 41, but from that which is inside give charitable gifts. And behold, all things are clean for you. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe the mint and rue and every garden herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These things you ought to have done without neglecting the others. In other words, the tithing you ought to have done without neglecting the, the weightier things, the love and justice. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So how can I be right with God and commune with God? This is key to salvation. This is key to following Jesus. This is key to living a life that is pleasing to God and in communion with God. How can I be right with God and actually commune with him? What does Jesus call and seek for me to do and to be like? Ever ask that question? We should ask that question every day. Pray that question in the morning. Pray it all through the day. Lord, what do you want from me? How would you have me act and speak and think and feel and direct myself? Okay, so what does Jesus call for and seek from me? Do you think clean outside only is the answer? In other words, what I do externally, just my external actions that everybody else can see most of the time, and maybe sometimes even some external stuff that I do that nobody else is seeing. Is that it? Is that all he's interested in? I'll give you that option. A second option would be clean inside only. 
Just kind of the way I'm feeling internally is the only thing that matters. The outside doesn't matter. So we have this question before us, what is truly being right with God and right with people? What is being actually righteous? This higher righteousness that Jesus is talking about that we must uh, somehow live in if we're even going to begin to think about being part of the kingdom of heaven. What is truly being holy? What is the aim of what Christians call and the Bible calls sanctification in a communion with God? We're going to share Holy Communion next week on Communion Sunday, the, the Lord's Supper. What are we talking about with this communion? Is it related to external only actions, including public actions, or internal? Which one is it? Well, I have good news for you, perhaps. It's challenging news, though. It resolves the conflict that I've been putting before us for the last minute. It turns out Jesus is not an either-or on internal or external. Jesus is not either-or on this. Now, some Christians falsely believe and even falsely teach that Jesus is only internal. They kind of do the whole pendulum swing in total juxtaposition and opposition to Pharisee type people. They say, no, 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 the Christian thing is all about, because we overcome legalism and we're not legalists, therefore it's all internal. Jesus does not say that. In fact, he doesn't pit a so-called right heart versus right actions, but he integrates them. He integrates them. So let's go into our story now. So a Pharisee extends a, a lunch invitation while Jesus is speaking. And in extending this invitation while Jesus is teaching and Luke telling us this, we're supposed to remember what Jesus has just been teaching. Okay, that's a cue. Remember, when you're reading the Bible, always kind of read for the cues. And so while Jesus is teaching, we should obviously ask the question, what was he just teaching? We can go through all of Luke chapter 11, but most definitely we're gonna go back to the preceding several verses. But before we do that, let me go ahead and highlight what occurred to me in looking at this passage of Scripture. This is actually a pretty important passage of Scripture. I think we're supposed to really pay attention to this related to Jesus' table fellowship and his ongoing and developing conflict with the Pharisees about what real faith and faithfulness look like. Because let me tell you this, this is kind of interesting. In Luke's Gospel, there are seven accounts of Jesus having table fellowship. Okay, all the way up to and including the Lord's Supper, seven of them. Uh, by the way, if you know Bible numbers, do you think that's by accident that Luke has framed out seven table fellowship encounters for Jesus? And the answer is no, seven's a big biblical number for completeness, okay? This is the fourth of the seven. What does that mean? It's the central one, with me? Okay, then Luke also frames out in the midst of those seven, there are three times that Jesus eats with Pharisees. Three times. Do you think that number's by accident? No, that's a big number in the Bible too, you know, related to God and holiness and completeness within the Godhead. Guess which dinner this is among the three? It's the middle one. So it's the middle of all the table fellowship stories in all the Gospel of Luke, and it's the central of the three having to do of Jesus with Pharisees. So I think we're supposed to pay attention to this passage. Now, this gets into kind of intramural Jewish you know, conflict stuff that honestly I know most of us are not that well versed on. So apologies up front. If we hadn't disciplined ourselves to say we're going to preach through all the gospel of Luke, I could have easily avoided this passage and the passage that Dean is going to be pre preaching on next week, which is going to follow up with a initial renunciation and denunciation Jesus gives to a Pharisee and three woes to the Pharisees. Jesus is going to turn around and get even more heated as he lays three woes on the scribes. Dean gets that passage next week. And that's simply because we're preaching through every single verse of Luke. But, like I'm telling you, this is actually a pretty important passage. So let's take a step back. Speaking of intramural Jewish um, you know, conflict and parties and such, let me remind you that the Pharisees are a very influential group in Judaism at the time of Jesus, and they're highlighted in the New Testament. 
you may know this, you may not. The Apostle Paul, who wrote major portions of the New Testament, grew up and was educated as a Pharisee. In fact, he was trained under the rabbinic scholar Gamaliel, who was in the direct family line of, in some ways, the most famous, uh, more creative rabbinic scholar named Hillel from leading up to the time of Jesus. So, you know, Pharisees are important. Pharisee, what does that mean? It literally means the set-apart ones. They are set apart as far as belonging to God. They are Jews as the chosen people, and they're doubling down on that saying, we are set apart as chosen people of God, the Jews, who are rigorously going to be dedicated to God. That's what their name means. And they built up, the Pharisees did, an entire, over centuries, rabbinic teaching about um, the first five books of the Bible in particular, which are called Torah the instruction or the law. And they have all kinds of rabbinic traditions and teachings, and these get documented and compiled in something called the Mishnah uh, f that runs through right before the time of Jesus, teaching before the time of Jesus and a little bit after the time of Jesus. And then later, these even larger tomes that are called the Talmud, okay? So they get a lot of teaching on... Um, what they see is the 613 laws or commandments of the Torah, and they're very serious about every single one, okay? So, and they write all kinds of legislation and further elaboration of, well, what does this actually mean, and how far exactly can you walk, and what would be a violation of this commandment? They've got all kinds of rabbinic teachings over the years, and, uh, and they cite one another. That's why when Jesus teaches, they're astounded because he never goes back and cites like Rabbi Shammai or Rabbi Hillel. He teaches as one who has his own authority. They're astounded by this because he doesn't go back and cite all these other people. Uh, but this is the way the Pharisees do. A related group um, that develops, uh, that, that you see nowadays that's kind of in this line of the Pharisees would be the uh, Haredi Jews who are in Israel now and in New York City, by the way, the folks with the ringlets and the beards and the various kind of big hats, various colors, depending on which kind of Jewish party they're with. And, and a subgroup of them would be the um, Hasidic Jews, Hasidim, that means the pious ones. Haredi means like they're the fearful and reverent before the Lord one. Okay, so back to this story. So this guy's really serious about his religion. It ties in with Judaism. And here he is, um, and he's one of these kind of folks that Jesus says, your righteousness, my disciples, needs to exceed theirs. So how are we going to get there? Well, the Pharisee, Luke tells us, either interrupts or right after Jesus finishes talking, inviting him to lunch. What was Jesus just talking about? We, we looked at this last week. I'll pick up at verse 34 of Luke 11. Jesus says, the lamp of the body is your eye. When your eye is, and the Greek word there was haplous, which means generous, open, undivided, wholly in with God, basically, and with other people. When your eye is good, generous, undivided. When your eye is good, Jesus says, when your eye is generous, gracious, also your whole body is full of light. See that light coming in, light going out. But when it is bad, and the term there would be extended then to be poneros, would be like um, grudging, mean, you know, out for your own best interest. When your eye is bad, when that's your perspective on life and other people, also your body is full of darkness. So watch out that the light in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light with no part dark in it, it will be wholly illumined. Now this is the good news invitation from Jesus. Okay, in this teaching. No part dark in it, it will be wholly illumined as when a light gives you, uh, as when a lamp gives you light with its rays. That's what Jesus just taught about. The evil eye, the grudging eye versus the good, gracious, generous, giving, somebody who gives, like actually literally gives, and who is gracious towards other people. Either good eye like that or bad eye. And that determines whether you're dark on the inside or you have light on the inside. 
So Luke is telling us Jesus just finished talking about this issue of light and darkness on what's going on inside and what flows out to the outside. And in the midst of that, uh, this Pharisee, this rigorous follower of the law, invites Jesus to have lunch. Let's talk about this further. And then we read that Jesus comes to have lunch, and he doesn't, to the shock of the Pharisee, Jesus does not go through this whole ritual cleansing. He doesn't have himself cleansed. The Greek here, this is the only time in the New Testament where it's used like this. Usually there are other words used for cleansing. Here the word for cleansing, this caught my attention. I'm giving this to you. I know this is Greek stuff, but it was it's pretty interesting. The only time in the entire New Testament when you have a reference to cleansing like this as being baptized. The words used mean Jesus wasn't baptized. So that's literally what it means in the Greek. So the, the Pharisee is shocked that Jesus doesn't go through this outward external baptism, immersion, before he has lunch. Why would the Pharisee think Jesus needs to do that? Okay? Because when you went to the temple to be with God, you needed to go through ritual cleansing so that you were freed from the defilement of the outside world and anything that was unclean. And why did you need to do that under the law? Because it was God's way of saying symbolically, I am holy. You are not naturally holy. You need to be reverent and to be aware of a need for internal cleansing when you come to me. That's actually why it's in the law. The Pharisees had extended this to everywhere they went, whenever they fellowshiped, whenever they had dinner. This is not being worried about hygiene. This is not being worried about COVID-19. If you're old enough like I am to remember 2020 and 2021, a lot of people were freaked out about hygiene all the time, right? This is not why these guys are doing this. They are trying to be rigorously holy before the Lord. So they've extended temple practices out to everything they do out in regular life. And the Pharisee says, well, obviously, Jesus, he's a holy man. He's a religious man. He's going to want to do this too. And Jesus specifically does not do this. He is not immersed before having one. He, he does not think he needs to be baptized before he has this sit-down, reclining lunch with the Pharisee. And then Jesus says this to him because he knows what the guy's thinking. Now, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but your inside is full of greed and wickedness. So Jesus responds and really takes on the Pharisees and this particular Pharisee. You sure you want to have Jesus over for lunch? He brings a lot of conviction, okay? So he is, he is bringing this on. With the, and he moves from the cup dish imagery pretty quickly to the guy and to what's going on inside the guy. And then he says, you foolish ones, did God who made the outside not make the inside also? Now, notice Jesus, like I talked about earlier, is speaking with authority directly because Jesus, as the word of God, is the giver of the law that's in dispute, okay, how you interpret it. And Jesus is the one who brings, as John says, the law came through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So Jesus is taking us through the law with the lens of grace and truth. And then he gives us what I consider the most important verse of the ones we're looking at today, verse 41 of Luke 11. But from that which is inside, give charitable gifts. The term that's used here can be translated as alms, but in general it means like mercy giving, okay? Like, in other words, Jesus says all of your giving should be out of grace. That's what he's saying. Elie Musene, that's what he's saying. And behold, then all things are clean for you, both the inside and the outside and your true soul. That's your key verse. That's the good news. We'll come back to that. And then Jesus proceeds to, you know, you would say, well, that's good, Jesus. You kind of renounced him, but now you've given him a little bit of good news opportunity to respond. And Jesus is tough at this point. He lays three woes on the Pharisees, and then, like I said, he's going to come back with three on the scribes, too, when a scribe interrupts and says, teacher, you're insulting us also. Jesus says, oh, yeah, well, let me give three woes for y'all. 
He says this, Woe to you Pharisees, this is the first, for you tithe mint and rue and every garden herb. In other words, they're supposed to, under the law, this is actually the law, this is not just tradition, under the law, they are supposed to tithe, give the first tenth, the first fruits tenth of every single thing that comes from the ground. So Jesus is either going to their exaggeration or kind of making a joke. Even when you get mint leaves that you'd like put in tea, you're tithing that too, Jesus says. You're meticulous in this. But listen, Jesus says, you're forgetting the most important things of the law, love and justice. And then what he's going to say is love and justice should drive your giving as well as your witness, as well as how you relate to other people. That's what Jesus is actually saying. So back to what we've said already. Number one, Jesus is not either or on internal or external. He integrates them both. He says they both, he's not, I know at least Alan Massengill knows this term because he used it on Wednesday night. Jesus is not what's called antinomian. He's not against the law, okay? <laughs> And, and Christianity is not antinomian. It's just like, well, yeah, sure, it's all grace. Do whatever your heart tells you to do. No, Jesus is not antinomian. He doesn't say, just have a sweet little emotional heart for me when you're singing a song at church. That's not what he says. But he talks about priority and purpose. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every garden herb and neglect the justice and the love of God these things you ought to have done. In other words, yeah, you need to tithe. This is Jesus' best opportunity to say, I'm abrogating the tithe. And by the way, all Gentiles, it'll never apply to you or any kind of concept of giving. It's just all have a sweet little heart for me. Jesus does not do that here. He says, you should have done the former, but the most important thing is you should do what's most important, love and justice. And the love and justice ought to drive your tithing and your charitable giving. Remember, Jesus says, whoever relaxes the least one of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Which brings us to number two, and this is priority and purpose. Jesus warns the Pharisees and he warns us about kingdom essentials. What's the best way to clean a cup? Men and women who've ever cleaned cups, you know, with your hands, go inside first, and then the outside flows from that, right? If I'm going to clean your cup, believe me, that's the way I'm going to do it. And Jesus says exactly that, priority, right? He's led us in priority, now he continues. Jesus warns us about kingdom essentials. Baptize and give from the inside out. Priority is to go inside first. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, what the choir just sang. And then we're going to get to and renew a right spirit in me in just a moment. So in other words, we've got Pharisees who are doing everything rigorously right on the outside, but Jesus is saying, you're rotten in your heart. You're doing it because of arrogant religious pride. You're doing it because people act like in the market and in the synagogues, they give you the best seats and they act like you're really important. And then Jesus continues to lay these woes on the Pharisees, but let me make this clear. These woes are not a final judgment. They are a lament by Jesus. Still right now, he's still on earth. He hasn't gone to the cross yet. He is inviting Pharisees, including Pharisees like Nicodemus, to repent and believe in him, to turn from thinking that, remember Ephesians 8? excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 that we just recited. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is a gift from God. This is not your own doing. It's not by works so that no one should boast. But then verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 2. For you are God's workmanship created, what, for what? For good works. Okay, we're going to get like, you know, don't believe easy believism Christianity. We get to, we're supposed to respond with fruit, but we go to the root first, right? So, reminded of this, so Jesus is extending this gospel invitation. Monday morning, I had the joy of being with John Rush and family for his mom's memorial service. And John told 
two or three stories that I think I'd like to employ at some point, but I'm gonna go ahead and use one of them right now, which is when John was around either five or six. John is by far the baby of his, grew up as the baby of his family. His sister's seven and a half years older than he is. His brother is, am I right on that, John? Okay, 10. Okay, and your brother, yeah. So your brother is a decade older, right? So John was like the baby. So John, it turns out, was a little bit of a pistol growing up. And so there were some challenges with, let's say, both his actions, but also, let's go internally, his attitudes, right? So it's both and, attitudes and actions. And so his mom, who's in her 40s, as she's dealing with this little pistol, who's like five and six years old, at one point she reached the end of her rope. Now what I'm about to say is don't employ this in your own home unless God so leads you to do this. But one day when, when she had had enough from John and John was just out of control, she suddenly went and put all of John's toys in one cardboard box and put all of his clothes in another cardboard box. So she's got these two boxes with all his toys and all his clothes and she walks him outside the house and he's confused. This has never happened before. What is going on? And she said, this is all you own in the world. Good luck. And so, um, you know, John said in his household, the words were never spoken, wait till your father gets home, because his mom was a serious disciplinarian, as you can hear. So this is a wake-up call. And when John's dad came home sometime later, John is outside crying and says, what's going on? And he said, mom has ban banished me from the house. I'm no longer in that. He probably didn't use that terminology at his age, but basically he said, I've been exiled, you know, I'm out. And John's dad said, well, let's go in and talk to mom. And they had this huge family meeting that went on for a while. They went through all of John's attitudes and actions that were out of line. And John had to sign a written contract that his mother had composed for him, agreeing to change all of his attitudes and actions in the direction of being a member of the family, continuing. That's what Jesus basically is doing with the Pharisees and the scribes right now. It's not a final judgment, but it is a serious wake-up call. Uh, that's what we're dealing with as he lays these woes on these prideful, wrong attitude, Sure, you've got the actions going on, but you've got them going legalistically instead of out of love and graciousness. And so then he calls, folks, and he calls us to be baptized and to give from the inside out. Which brings us back to what are you going to seek today, this week, and in your life with the Lord? For what, for whom does Jesus invite me to ask? And that gets us back to where the power comes from, to rearrange the priorities and to make our purpose right with God's purpose. So number three, the way to be clean and right from the inside out, heart, eye, and action, is to ask for, to open ourselves, to yield ourselves to the convicting, transforming power of God's Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit. Create in me a clean heart and renew a what? Right spirit in me so that my spirit responds to God's spirit and God's spirit claims me and cleans me from the inside out. What is the most, in some ways, the most important verse that we've covered in Luke chapter 11 over the last few months? It's flowing from in the aftermath of Jesus' teaching his disciples how to pray to the Father. You know, he goes through the Lord's Prayer. What's the end game? What's the purpose of the Lord's Prayer? Jesus gives it to us in verse 13 of Luke 11. He says this, so if you who are evil, in other words, flawed parents, if you who are evil know good gifts to give to your children, how much more the Father who is in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those who ever are asking him. If we're really praying the Lord's Prayer in truth, what are we asking for? Jesus says, seek and you'll find. 
knock and the door will be open. What do we, what do we want the door open to? To a living relationship with God. And how does that happen? Jesus just told us, if we're truly praying to God as Father and truly asking for his kingdom to come, for his name to be hallowed, for his will to be done, including in my life, I'm asking for the Holy Spirit to run my life and take over. I'm asking, I'm yielding myself to stop trying to do it my way and asking God to change my heart and change my actions. Yes, both and from the inside out. I'm asking God, because by the way, water baptism by itself is nothing. I must be baptized in the power and in the love of the Holy Spirit. So God is inviting me to come to him as Father and ask ultimately that I might be baptized in the Holy Spirit from the inside out and that therefore flowing from that I might give to the God who has given me everything because ultimately the Spirit is the Lord and the Lord is the Spirit. And who is the Lord? It's Jesus who gave up all the riches of heaven to come and save us the one who died so that I might live. That's who this is. That is the spirit we're talking about, one who gives himself. His life is not for him. His life is given for you. And he calls us as we grow in his spirit to understand my life is not about aggrandizing me. It's not about me sitting in the chief seats of the synagogue and being held up as a godly person. It's all about giving myself a way that Jesus might be formed within me and I might be reformed and renewed in Jesus by the power of his spirit. This is the life that we seek. This is what we pray for. We pray for nothing less than God himself and the spirit of the living Lord Jesus ascended and at the right hand of God working in my life and yours. Now that's a clean cup, and that's a cup that can honor God. That is a vessel that is changed and transformed. And so we move all the way through Jesus' teaching. Priority, the purpose of being faithful, and the power, his power in us. Because when we are weak, as Paul says, he is strong within us. His grace is sufficient. So no matter what you're struggling with right now, whether it's moral, whether it's relational, whether it's work, whether it's your health, I invite you to yield and trust and open your heart, open your house, and open everything you do to the cleansing and the life-giving power of his spirit, now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.